Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm happy to say hello to Bruce Napoka. Hi there. Unfortunately, I can't be there with you, but uh, I'm trying to imagine that I am. My name is Richard, and I work for the Transport Research Center in the Czech Republic. My background lies in mathematics and statistics, but uh, please uh, don't be afraid of my presentation. I have counted the number of mathematical formulas in, in it, and uh, it is approximately zero. I have highlighted on purpose experimental studies in the title of my talk. Experimental studies form only a tiny part of all the studies. In general, in road safety, there are only two and a half percent of experimental studies. Why? The reason is simple. Experimental studies are more expensive, more expensive in terms of money, in terms of planning and coordination, and in terms of time. And when it comes to wildlife vehicle collisions, there is a danger that we collect only a small amount of data, not enough to reach statistical significance. Well, uh, what can we do about it? It requires careful planning, careful selection of statistical methods, and it is an advantage to perform power analysis in advance. Power analysis tells us how many recalls we need to reach a certain probability level that the effect will be detected. For example, with a sample size of 50 depicted in red, it is quite likely that we will catch an effect of 80% reduction and stronger. With a sample size of 100 depicted in yellow, we will likely recognize an effect of 60% reduction and stronger. In effect, the power analysis gives us some guidance about how much effort in terms of money and time should be invested in our study. In the first part of my presentation, I'd like to show you several statistical methods applied to a toy illustrative example. The first two are more or less standard. And we have developed the third one, which is based on the Bayesian inference, to assess the issue of low sample sizes. The second part of my presentation will be devoted to preliminary results from our ongoing study. Let's start with the toy example. Let's say that there is a location where 100 road kills are expected to occur during the study. Three effects are in the play. The effect of the mitigation measure, the effect of the site, and the effect of the period. We can see that uh, the before-after study design would overestimate the effect in this case. On the other hand, the control impact study would underestimate the effect. That is why the before-after control impact study is superior to them. By the way, I have recently found out that the BACI is also an Italian company producing chocolate sweets. Maybe another reason why BACI study should be preferred. However, under certain circumstances, before after, or control impact studies can be, can be used. We would just have to assume that there is either no effect of the site or no effect of the period. Of course, we usually do not monitor only one site. If we assume that uh, the effect of the mitigation measure is uniform across the sites, we can use a CMH test to directly evaluate the effect. A natural question can arise. Can we pull the data? Yes, actually we can. If the effect of the period does not vary across the sites, then we can pull all the data and simply use the OS ratio. But uh, what if we reach only statistically no significant results? 
It does not prove that the mitigation measure does not work at all. Maybe we just don't have enough data. So what does it mean? Can we say at least something about the mitigation measure? It turns out that we can, by the means of the Bayesian inference. Our approach based on the Bayesian inference can answer not only questions like, is there a positive effect of the mitigation measure? And uh, what is the extent of this effect? An uh, important thing is that by using the Bayesian approach, we can identify the maximum possible effect of the mitigation measure. If the first two points are inconclusive, this is the crucial piece of information. For example, if we conclude that the reduction is at most 10%, I believe that we would be no longer inter interested in such a measure. On the other hand, if the reduction is at most 70%, like in our toy example, we can still see some potential in the measure even if the previous two points were inconclusive. Our study on the effectiveness of water repellent started in spring 2021. It focuses on angulates, namely roe deer and wild boar. We've been monitoring approximately 150 kilometers of roads once a week, 14 weeks per year. If a single person would walk all the distance, it would be 8,400 kilometers. It is more than the driving distance from Gibraltar to Cluj-Napoca, Epoca, with a stop in Prague and back. Just to illustrate the, uh, the, honor, the enormous extent of the study. And now imagine that uh, the only result of this study would be not significant. Therefore, we tried to plan the study as carefully as possible, considering the study design, the costs and the statistical methods. Our goal was to at least detect an effect of 50% or higher. Thanks to the power analysis, we knew that we need at least 200 and 30 records. <clears throat> so far, we have observed 327 records and we are waiting for the data from the autumn monitoring this year. Taking into account only data from spring, we have 214 records at hand. Preliminary results show that both the CMH test and odds ratio give only no significant results. So what should we do? Luckily, we can use Bayes in France. Bayes concludes that the probability of a positive effect is almost 70%. So there is rather a positive effect than a negative effect, but 70% is still ra rather low to make any conclusions. Anyway, using the Bayesian inference, we can conclude that there is so-called strong evidence for at most 44% reduction of wildlife vehicle collisions. It means that we can be quite sure that the effect is not stronger than a 44% reduction. In summary, I'd like to emphasize three things. Careful planning is necessary. If needed, we should focus on looking for new approaches. And studies of this size cannot be carried out by a single person. There is a need for cooperation between experts in different fields. These three points will help us to reduce the risk of wasting money and time. But beware, there are also other risks in conducting such a study. Thanks for your attention. Thanks, Richard, for the challenging presentation. You are here. You can answer live to some questions.
Richard, good morning. Um, good morning. I was uh, thinking you said there were 14 weeks of uh, monitoring. Is it uh, in a row, you know, um, and, and related to habituation to the impact of the mitigation? So if you continue measuring a year or maybe two years, what do you think will happen with this uh, odor repellent? Mm, yes, we thought about this uh, habituation effect, and uh, this can be part of our follow-up study. So uh, the data we have collected so far uh, would not prove or disprove if there is any habituation effect or not. Okay. More questions? Well, um, I'm not very familiar with these Bayesian approaches. I know they are very, they have a great potential. But for instance, for a regular research to be done, uh, this analysis seems, it maybe seems only, uh, very complex and needed some expertise. Do you think it can, most teams working on roadkill, can do it easily, they will need some uh, specific train, they will need some cooperation with some specific teams. How to generalize your proposal? It's easy? Uh, well, that's the reason why I mentioned that uh, it's good to cooperate between uh, people of uh, different fields, because uh, for mathematicians, uh, it's an easy approach, uh, but it would need some course or training uh, for other people. Okay.